something called production management, which is the planning and logistics of how those programmes are made. The people who book the hotels and look after the budgets, and most television and radio departments will have those as well. That all goes within the banner of content making. Um, next door to that is journalism, which is a kind of is a kind of content making on its own, but for the BBC is very important because we've got all those local radio stations, our, the BBC News Channel, our network, the national news broadcasts. We do an awful lot of journalism, so that kind of gets its own box on the screen. Next door to that, however, is kind of the area I'm in now. Um, I used to be in content making and now I'm in a, what we call a business support role. Any big organisation will have its core business, but behind the scenes there'll be an army of people doing uh, a variety of different careers. So for instance, you know, I work in training and development. I work across, oh, not, the, not just yet, Kayla, <laughs> head back, almost. So, for instance, um, I work in training and development. I work in apprenticeships and training schemes. Um, I help recruit new apprentices and trainees and help mentor them on their journey through their career with us. Um, but it's not just that we have a HR department in Birmingham. We have media lawyers. We need media lawyers to get us out of trouble if somebody says something they shouldn't do on air or if, heaven forbid, there's an accident somewhere. That's what we need media lawyers. We have marketing people. We have comms people who do write press releases and organise screen screenings for our latest dramas. Okay, we have business managers. The Winter Olympics is on at the moment. BBC Sports have a business management team who have to liaise with broadcasters in different countries and work with find, work with suppliers and source suppliers in terms of how they bring those programmes in China to you in your living room or on your mobile phone. There's a, so there's a whole array of kind of support roles that you can do at the BBC. Uh, the final box is technology, which is by far the biggest expanding industry of broadcasting. Doesn't matter whether it's us, Channel 4, ITV, Netflix, or Amazon. It's all about the tech. There are two strands to this. One is what I call hardware engineering or broadcast engineering. These are the people who would fix the cameras and the outside broadcast trucks. The people have to know how every piece of kit that the BBC uses works and how to fix it to make sure we stay on air. But next door to that is software at the side of things. This is by far the biggest expanding area of the industry. This is driven by you, the audience, because if you want to watch the skiing at the Olympics on your mobile phone at four o'clock in the morning, we've got to find a way of doing that. If we're doing broadcasting Glastonbury and you want to watch the pyramid stage, you know, on your laptop, we have to find a way of doing that. So the way people are consuming content nowadays with machine learning, with personalization, the way platforms like iPlayer and our competitors over at Netflix and Amazon Prime work is requires an army of software engineers, software testers, what we call UX user experience designers to build and design those websites. And you can't just build them and leave them there anymore. They've got to evolve and change all the time. So there's a, a huge array of technical roles at the BBC as well. So you quids in if anyone's got children interested in software engineering or coding. Um, and now we can go to the next slide. Um, so to bear in mind, I just looked at our, our website today, um, taking away the, the core business roles, producers and journalists, that kind of thing. This was just on the first two pages. And we had over 20 pages of current job roles, a UX designer, a production manager, a data manager for metadata. That's all to do with personalization, how we manage people's data, a marketing coordinator, an events producer. You know, we do big events all over the country. When Radio 1 do tours, there are events that have to be managed. Business affairs assistants, a finance analyst. We need finance people, social media manager. Every program now will have its own social media content. We need people to manage that. So that's just a small glimpse of the kind of range of different roles you can have at the BBC that's even outside the core business. On to the next slide. So just quickly what we're looking for. Um, what we're looking for is a passion and demonstrable interest for that particular career pathway. So if you're interested, if your child is interested in content making, are they making their own blogs and vlogs and films? Are they volunteering, volunteering at community radio stations, for instance? Because actually, when you've got one of these, people can make, we can all be content makers today. When I was uh, 16, if I want to make my own program, I have to hire a camera that's half the size of my living room and then spend thousands of pounds on editing facilities. Whereas now you can get your smartphone and record audio or video and stick it on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and you're a content maker. So that's the kind of thing that is happening anyway, and that's the kind of Thing they're looking for. Do you have the natural urge to make your own content? And it's also about bringing your own ideas to the table as well, regardless of the career pathway. You know, broadcasting is an industry that thrives on new ideas. Um, next slide, please. I don't want to over overrun. Um, so we talk about the apprenticeships and our entry level schemes, all the kind of job roles I described. We now have some form of apprenticeship at a particular level um, to suit whatever learner is available. And it's all done on our website, which you can see on the next slide. Um, that's our careers for website. Everyone applies for any job or apprenticeship or training scheme via there. 
the key thing for apprenticeships is the kickstart your career tab. They're all on there. So all apprenticeships across all career pathways are on that tab on our careers website, which is bbc.co.uk forward slash careers. So let's look at briefly mention some of them. Um, this is the core business. Um, it's, it's worth mentioning these because these are actually open right now for a September start this year. So this is the production and journalism fast track apprenticeships designed mostly at people leaving college. We've got higher level qualifications, people maybe leaving university. But if you look at this for production, our core business, there is no academic entry requirement whatsoever. You do not need a degree to come up with an idea for Blue Peter. You do not need an A-level BTEC in media to pick up a phone and start filming. You do need that natural desire and passion for content making. So they're not looking for qualifications. They're focusing on creativity, potential and drivers, they say there. And that's for core business. So that's our production apprenticeship um, recruiting that now for September start. And there's usually 30, 40 places all over the UK for that. And it's something similar for our journalism fast track apprenticeship. Again, they only, they're only looking for GCSEs, English and maths. Um, Apart from that, they're not interested in qualifications, just the natural capacity to be interested in journalism. I mentioned all those other career pathways. These all just recruited just before Christmas. And you can see the kind of range of the different careers you can have. We did a recruited a business administration apprentice at level three, a business management higher level degree apprenticeship. We're really big on degree apprenticeships, which is brilliant. Um, if, if people looking to move into vocational employment or trouble thinking should I go to university instead well actually a degree apprenticeship is a brilliant way you can have both where your employer can pay for your degree for you and you're earning money on the job as well so we're doing a lot more degree apprenticeship offering those to potential applicants and we're doing one there in business management we're doing another one data an data analysts we've got HR support apprenticeships broadcast technical operators they're the people I mentioned who do the, sh the cameras and the sound and lighting broadcast engineers the people who fix those cameras and those uh, lighting rigs as I mentioned Increasingly, it's all about software and set tech. So we've done software engineering apprenticeships. They'll look at both level four for college leavers if they don't want to do a degree and for level six if they do want a degree. And we do like UX design apprenticeship scheme. UX design is how people design how websites and designed and the psychology of how people move through them as well. And why do they only scroll down so far on a page? What pages they click? We do a degree apprenticeship in that as well. So that's just kind of a flavor of the range of apprenticeships that you can get at the BBC. It's not just production and journalism. And that's really important for us to get across to parents and to potential applicants. All those David, kind of I'm sorry, you've only got about a minute, I'm afraid. Is that okay? I'm, I'm kind of done, more or less, to be honest. Oh, that's good. That was timely. Sorry, I didn't want to bring you to an abrupt end if you want well, to finish well, off. No, I'm, I'm completely hogged way too much time now, but that's just, that just final slide's a good guide to show you the range of kind of careers you can have at the BBC. Thank you so, so much. Is there many more slides? Because I'm wondering whether we could maybe share them if the audience would like to see them in their entirety. I don't mind people sharing those slides. OK, that's wonderful. As as Thank you very much, David. That's that's oh. super. That's great. I think we've, we've obviously already got them so we can circulate those. Lovely. So, so thanks to David. And we're going to go across now to Jade Gates and Jade's from Bruntwood. Thanks, Jade. Hi, um, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you all about Bruntwood and the apprenticeships we offer. If we could just start on the first slide, please. So who are Bruntwood? We are a family owned business. We've been around for 40 plus years. Over 40 years ago, we started out with the vision of transforming unloved buildings for commercial use while still retaining the original character and the value that once made them special. And this core vision, it still remains true to this day, but the business has evolved to create vibrant communities and campuses that help um, businesses grow. We could just move on to the next slide, please. So we are a national business. We've got properties across Manchester, Cheshire, Birmingham, Liverpool, Leeds, and we've recently expanded into Cambridge. Um, if you just pop along to the next slide, um, so you can see from the timeline that we are a really fast growing business and 
we're a business with a huge variety of specialisms within it. You know, in essence, we are a commercial property, but there are so many other roles within within the business that help help to support us. Um, so you might have seen some of our buildings around the city. You can see Block in Manchester city centre. And if you haven't been before, I would strongly recommend going there and grabbing a drink. It's got a really strong focus on well-being, and this is really reflected in the design. We've got retail spaces across the cities too, which include places like Afflex and Hatch, um, which you can see on the screen there. And then we've got science and tech spaces, including ID Manchester and Orderly Park out in Cheshire. Just on the next slide, please. So I wanted to show you our buildings just really what we actually do here at work, but I'll go into a little bit more detail about the different specialisms actually exist within the business. So we've got all the traditional specialisms of property, which include quantity surveying, building surveying, development, asset management, project management, and they help us to develop and maintain our spaces and expand our property portfolio. And then we've also got our commercial teams who connect our spaces to the right people. And then we've got our support functions in the business, which include our finance teams, marketing teams, human resources teams, corporate social responsibility, IT, and this is just to name a few. We've also got our customer facing teams, customer service and property services. So property services is made up of our front facing teams, which include roles like hosts and facilities team members. And we've got our cleaning teams to make sure our buildings are looking great for our customers. So I could sit here and I could talk all day about the different departments in the business. But the point is we've probably got a role that would pique most people's interest within the business. So what apprenticeships do we offer here at Bruntwood? Previously, we've always supported apprentices in vocational roles that you might typically expect to see this type of training, which includes things like plumbing and electrical. And you'll now find these types of apprenticeships in our partner company, Cubic Works. But in recent years, we've expanded um, the types of apprenticeships that we offer massively. And this is nationally because the breadth of apprenticeships that are available is, is huge. So we've offered apprenticeships in our finance teams, um, in our surveying teams. Um, so likewise, we offer degree apprenticeships for building surveying, quantity surveying. Um, and this is where we'll fund the university degree and, and the young person will, will get um, a salary with it while they're learning. We've got um, apprenticeships in our customer service teams, in our corporate social responsibility teams, and we always keep an eye on any roles that could potentially be an apprenticeship. And you'll find all of our opportunities on our website, which is just frontward.co.uk and then you just head over to the careers page um, and we've also got a huge range of opportunities for people that are just starting out in their careers outside of apprenticeships so I'd always encourage people to look at this too so we've got a really great learning and development op offering to our colleagues and we're really committed to supporting colleagues to taking their career in new directions and making sure that they've got the right skills to be able to thrive we don't necessarily expect people to come into the business and have those skills straight away. You know, we want people to learn and, and grow with us. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with why we value apprenticeships so much here. And I think, as I spoke about before, the scope of apprenticeships has changed absolutely massively in recent years, meaning that more specialisms can actually be studied through the route of an apprenticeship. Um, and they're hugely beneficial to both apprentices and businesses. So apprentices are able to put into practice what they've learned straight away, understanding how theory translates into a real work situation. Apprenticeships really can propel people through their careers. You get this great network of support 
from the training provider and from the business and the experts within the business. So the breadth of what you learn is really, really exciting for apprentices. Um, but it's not a one way street. Apprentices support us and our business in, in a huge way. They bring fresh ideas and perspective into the business and they help us to stay connected to evolving practices and we're able to learn and grow with our apprentices. So it's really a win win um, for all of us. So what do we look for when we're bringing people into the business? We look for people who are thrilled by the idea of work that makes a real difference to people's lives. Um, we look for people who want to make a difference and improve things for generations to come. And we look for people who care deeply about the world around us. Um, so I hope you found that useful and I look forward to hearing any questions that you might have at the end. That's wonderful, Jade. Thanks, thanks ever so much. Just keeping an eye on the chat, there's one or two questions coming through, but I think we're OK just to leave them um, for a little while yet. That was fantastic. Um, that was really insightful for me, actually. I used to be a careers advisor. I'm a little bit out of touch with some of the, um, the sort of the, the obvious apprenticeships, but that's amazing. Such a comprehensive offer from Bruntwood, isn't it? Like so many different professions and so many different sectors within it. Yeah, I look every day at apprenticeships. I'm always surprised. Oh, you can now do this for an apprenticeship. Yeah. It's, it, really, it really is an exciting offer, isn't it, for young people? Wonderful. OK, thanks, Jade. I'm going to move over now. We're going to get two for the price of one. We've got um, double the quality and the numbers. Um, Sue Ledgood and Joanne Ritchie are now going to speak to us from Grant Barnes. And over to you, ladies. I knew I was going to uh, be on mute. It's all one right. Person, Don't worry. One, person had it. To, one person had to do it. Um, thanks very much. Do you want to go on to the next slide? Um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have the opportunity to talk to you all today. And it's um, brilliant to see so many of you on the um, webinar. So just a quick introduction from me. I'm Sue Ledgard and I am an account manager within our People Advisory Talent Solutions team here at Grant Thornton. Um, you may know us for being one of the world's leading accountancy, tax, audit and business advisory firms. Um, but what you may know, not know is that we uh, actually do a lot of work around apprenticeships and we're particularly proud of that. And the two ways, uh, sorry, there are two ways that we do this. One being that we've partnered with some of the country's top training providers to co-design some unique apprenticeships um, in which we've added some of the firm's real world business insights and expertise. And since 2017, when uh, the apprenticeships were significantly reformed and improved, we've trained over 4,000 of our clients' employees this way. Um, now, my, muff, my, muff, my myth buster was going to be um, about the misconceptions around the quality of apprenticeships, uh, previously known as NVQs, um, which, to be honest, for those of you that may be familiar um, with those, uh, they weren't the best. Um, but uh, lucky for me and you, uh, David and Jade uh, have already covered that um, in detail. So thanks very much to both of you for that. Um, so we actually have 14 different high quality advanced apprenticeship programmes covering leadership and management, finance, coaching and digital and data analytics, ranging from a level three, which is actually the equivalent of two A levels, right up through levels four and five, which are the equivalent of a year one and two foundation degree and up to bachelor's degree level six and master's degree level seven. Um, and just to put it into context, uh, we also have managing directors, directors, CEOs and business leaders um, completing apprenticeships with us. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Joe, who will explain a little bit more about our internal apprenticeship scheme and how all that works for people coming into Grant Thornton. 
Thank you. Thanks for handing over. Um, and thank you everyone for having me to do a, a small session on what Grant Thornton have to offer. The slide that is up on all of your screens will give you a lot of what we do, uh, but I wanted to kind of open with a fairly well a bit of an introduction as to who I am first of all so I um, head up all of our early careers and all of our professional qualifications across Grant Thornton so I'm obviously very passionate about all of this sort of thing um, and actually I've had about 10-15 years or so in this industry as an accountant first and foremost but nowadays focusing all of my efforts into getting young people and diverse young people into this profession so that's my top goal and actually it was quite straightforward for us as an accountancy or professional services firm to do apprenticeships because we kind of realised we've always been an apprenticeship provider. If you come into our workplace, you do exams historically and you learn how to be an accountant. So it was a super simple um, thing for us to switch to apprenticeships because actually you need to come in, you need to learn on the job whilst you earn, which was the primary ethos of apprenticeships. Um, so now, as we've just mentioned, we, we run apprenticeships across um, four, five, six different apprenticeships um, across a couple of different levels. So level four, level five, level six, seven. Um, and we offer both graduate and school leaver apprenticeships. Um, and obviously professional qualifications are included in our industry. Um, and it's for all of those graduates and school leavers that are interested in accountancy and business. Obviously, our graduates um, apprenticeships are for those that have finished their degrees, but crucially, it's the school leaver programmes that we offer that I think is of the most interest. Um, we realised many years back, actually, why are we just taking graduates into this profession, which is what we always did. We had a load of entry requirements. We offered it only to the top universities and we sat back and we thought, why are we doing that? Actually, we, we need more than just exams. Exams are one small part of what we do in accountancy. We need so many different skills and behaviours, so many backgrounds, so many perspectives to work with our client population. And actually, we need people fresh out of school that know already, I want to work in business, I want to work in accountancy. And that level of drive and passion for doing something, even without any of the knowledge of what the job entails, those were the sorts of people that we needed in our profession. Um, and, and frankly, for a long time, accountancy was wrongly associated with a love of maths, with calculators, graduate programmes and, and frankly, with with white men. Um, and actually, we've seen a significant change in our industry over the last 10, 15 years or so since I joined the profession. Um, we've moved away from those stereotypes. And we now have a really fantastic and diverse group of people, people that enjoy technical accounting. We have young people that enjoy the client conversations, that enjoy the team leadership. It's not about maths anymore. Um, and we're finally getting that balance of diversity that our industry has long needed. Um, so back when I joined, we had about 30% women in the profession um, and now certainly at Grant Thornton and I can speak on behalf of most of the top firms, we're close to 50% now women um, and that's a fantastic thing um, and we're seeing the same across all diversity strands. I think another point to note on, on this session actually is that we don't need to be fantastic at maths. It seems to be an association, but it's not the case. We need people that are keen to work in business with businesses. So we've removed all of our academic entry requirements and we have for, for some years now. Um, like I said, it's not about academic aptitude. It's about potential. It's about skills and behaviours outside of being able to do exams. And if you take me, for example, um, back when I was at school, I studied languages and I studied literature. Um, maths was actually one of my worst subjects, but I liked talking um, and I loved the idea of client conversations and business conversations. And I went into audit for that, uh, not for the maths and not for the accountancy. And I'm still here, so it, it's worked for me. Um, and we also recognise that as I said before, we've wrongly associated accountancy with graduate programmes. It's best learnt as an apprenticeship um, and exams are a small part of it for sure. Um, but actually it's our school leaver programme that stands out. And what we've been try trying to do is ever so slightly take down the number of graduates and ever so slightly move up the number of school leavers. Because actually by jumping straight into our profession after school, you can really get where you want to be so much faster. 
So again, if I just take me as a standard graduate as an example, I did a four year degree and then I spent three years studying to be an accountant at one of these big firms, much like Grant Thornton. So it took me a good seven years in total to get through to management. And the, the thousand or so school leavers that we work with, they come straight out of school having done their A-levels or equivalents. Um, they come in on a five year programme and after five years they're done. So having not been to university, and joined the same program I did, they get to where I got, but two years faster. Um, and actually we have fast track programs and all sorts of various talent recognition schemes to, to make that process even faster. So I think what I would say is just to understand the changing industry. We're looking for different people, different perspectives. We still have our graduate programs. We, we have so many fantastic school leaver programs and actually we're looking for potential. So if you're seeing that desire to work in business or that desire to work in accountancy, a good amount of logic and a good amount of reason, actually that might be best invested in an apprenticeship rather than studying something very similar at university um, because you're going to get where you want to be faster. So if you're lucky enough to have that drive at the outset, fantastic. Um, but if it takes university to, to figure that out, as it did for me and many, many others, then obviously there's a place for you in that respect as well. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give you a bit of a snapshot, debunk some of those myths, introduce myself and obviously welcome any questions that you might have at the end. So thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have got a couple of questions. As I say, we'll hold on to them though, if you don't mind, after we've heard from Darren um, next, please. So yeah, Darren, over to you. I don't, yeah, if you can flick on to the uh, first slide. And then I'll uh, I'll get going. Okay. Oh, that's got a funny colour. It all seems to have disappeared, but I'll crack on anyway. It seems the uh, backgrounds have disappeared, but no mind, uh, no bother. So uh, yeah, as it says on the screen, my name's Darren Blank. Um, I'm a project manager with Jackson Civil Engineering. Um, as you can see there, I came from a slightly different background. Um, so I started off in the forces. Um, for 15 years and I joined the civilian engineering sector about seven years ago. So my apprenticeship in life has been slightly different than what we're talking about today. Um, Jackson Civil Engineering themselves are a um, 100 million pound turnover company. We deliver flood defence works, roads and bridges, um, pretty sort of medium to large um, civil engineering tasks. Um, we offer a range of apprenticeships at Jackson's. Obviously, you've, you've heard from some of the other speakers. We follow pretty much the same model as you've already heard. We don't have a massive um, focus on exams, as has already been stated. It does say they require previous qualifications in English and maths. But as I've said to students when I've been out on careers evenings, that's by no means a stopper. Um, exams are just exams and it's about the it's about the day-to-day -day work out on site and it's about the soft skills that, that can be provided. So if, you, if your son or daughter has maybe not had the best performance at exam time, that should not be a stopper to moving on with the career that they want to choose. Um, we offer a range of, of levels as well as our uh, graduate placement programs. Um, you can see there these, so first of all we've got um, our engineering apprenticeship. So we split our apprenticeships between engineering and quantity surveying primarily and we're trying to identify more and more areas that we can offer apprenticeships moving forwards. So you can see straight away there um, down at level three level um, starting straight out of school leavers as a civil, civil engineering technician apprenticeship um, right up to there as a level six degree apprenticeship in either a civil engineering or civil engineers site management. Um, the bonus about Jackson's is we're not a huge monster company. We're more of a tier two contractor. So what that means is your son and daughter would not be lost in the system. Um, I currently have a team of uh, sort of seven on my site as a primary delivery and management team. Um, two of them are graduate placement engineers. So they're intrinsic to the day to day running of my site and I couldn't operate without them. So they're given a level of responsibility whilst they're learning both their soft skills and technical skills with a mentor above them. As we're moving on to the other side of um, 
as I mentioned, is the uh, QS. So we've got quantity, quantity surveying apprenticeships. So we have again from level three up to level six, starting off as a surveying technician. Um, so basically you would be employed as a, an assistant QS um, to either a senior QS or a standard QS on the job. Um, and you would shadow him or her um, following around and doing all the primary financial functions that are critical to the delivery of one of my projects. Um, and then dealing with clients, stakeholders. Um, it's an extremely important part of civil engineering. I don't think it's a well known. Um, it's a well known career. I think children or young adults generally hear the word surveyor and just think that it's someone who goes and looks at your house before you want to buy it. But really without a good quantity surveyor, there is no way that you can bid for a job operate that job effectively and commercially viably and support the my role as a project manager to go from cradle to grave, so to speak, um, and still be in a good viable position. So it's intrinsic to the overall structure of the project. So again, you can see there construction quantity surveying technician. These are just moving along um, along the, the line of surveying as then you get up to into your level six degree levels um, as a chartered surveyor. So that's ultimately where you'll be. A, um, a QS or a senior QS within my team. I don't know what time I'm on. I'm not really even looking. So this is how uh, generally it works. As I've mentioned, um, you wouldn't be lost in the system. Um, apprentices here is it's very flexible. So the old traditional route, as has already been mentioned in sort of electricians and plumbers, is they would work a fixed four day week and then go and spend a day in college. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case um, here because obviously we have roots of virtual learning. Um, we, we can package blocks of time. We can do part of a working day. Because I or my colleagues are in control of that individual project that that apprentice will be working on, we can really mould their working week um, to, that works both for the project, the business and their individual learning needs. So it doesn't have to be a fixed one size fits all package. Um, but it means that they get the right percentage of um, technical learning by their training provider versus the sort of mentoring soft skills and on site learning that they'll get just by being on the work face. Right again there, I, this is standard through uh, all of the apprenticeships that you'll be looking at. I'm sure as parents you'll be fully aware of how the apprenticeships works, but it just it goes it dives back into that where is the the advantage of uh, doing an apprenticeship it's the fact you're in a contract of employment you have a job already you're not going into a, a training provider whether it's college sixth form or university and then at the end of that having to try and find gainful employment you're being supported all the way through your learning um, knowing full well that at the end of that you're walking straight into a, a full-time position having learned all of those soft skills that you just wouldn't get by doing full time employment. I know it's fairly obvious or you wouldn't be here watching this presentation, but I think this is the biggest thing that we we need to as employers try and sell to students and in my case engineers of the future um, to go down this route because I really think it it's the future. And earning whilst you learn and money is never a bad thing to have in your pocket. So thank you for listening. I think I've whizzed through that fairly quickly because I realised that we're, we're that was great. Stretch. That was fantastic, um, Dan. Thank you so much for that. That's really interesting to hear your background and how you came to be in that particular professional space after the way you actually started out your sort of your professional life. And I think it's an important message that we need to get out to to young people and parents in care is that. You know there is no set way there's no sort of like normal or traditional way of doing a lot of these things and i think you gave that message really quite clearly there um as did the ladies from grant thornton so thank you for that so last but by no means least i've heard sam speak before and she's amazing so over to you sam from ces sorry ses engineering hi there everybody so i'm sam johnson community investment manager at ses engineering services SES are a building services engineering company or mechanical and electrical engineering, and we are part of the construction industry. Um, so what is building services? 
building services engineering is all about sorry <laughs> back to that slide um all about bringing buildings to life um, buildings must meet the needs of the people that live and work in them um, if you imagine yourself in the most fabulous building in the world but take away the lighting heating ventilation the plumbing power supply energy management security etc so all the the things that SES design and install in a building you're left in a cold dark uninhabitable shell so building services engineers really do bring buildings to life next slide please so our early careers programmes offer a range of exciting apprenticeships to school and college leavers and graduates, but it's important to remember that apprenticeships are open to people of all ages as well. So we've also got some of our management team that are completing apprenticeships at the moment. You'll see here that um, we have different level apprenticeships available from level two upwards. Um, and you can also see from the slide that there are different entry requirements for each level as well. Our apprentices are supported by our teams who have a breadth of knowledge across the business and there are also opportunities to do further qualifications once you've completed your apprenticeship. For example, we've got quantity surveyors that have completed their level four and have gone on to a master's in construction law. So um, there is the opportunity to do future learning. Um, next slide, please. Um, so from this slide, there's just a, a quick overview of the type of apprenticeships that we offer at SES. Um, there are some new apprenticeships coming through as well. We have building physics apprenticeships um, available and digital engineering apprenticeships. So building physics is all about how the buildings behave when they are complete. So um, moisture levels, levels of light, natural light versus artificial light, for example. Um, building information modelling is where we build the buildings on a computer screen digitally before we build them physically on site. So really useful for us and also the client as well. Um, as well as these types of apprenticeships, we have marketing teams, HR teams, finance teams and even lawyers who check our multi-million pound uh, contracts as well. Uh, you'd get the opportunity to rotate around the business to get an all round experience and build greater knowledge. Uh, there are also chances to move from one role to the other. You might do an apprenticeship in quantity surveyor, but then think you might want to move on to engineering. So we have people that have done that kind of thing too. So you're by no means stuck in the same role when you know you, the decision you make at a young age doesn't mean you're stuck in that role forever. Um, we have plumbing and electrical apprentices that now work as site planners, for example. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to touch on some construction myths because the construction industry is trying to attract a more diverse workforce. We need to challenge the misconceptions around the industry. Um, some people think it's only manual work when you work in construction. You'll have seen from those apprenticeships we've spoke about there. Many have a mix of site and office base. Some are only office base as well. Um, it's a male dominated industry. It is really still male dominated, but we are massively trying to improve on that and uh, get the number of females um, increased. Low qualifications. Um, some people say, oh, you don't want to go and work in construction. It's only for people who don't do well at school. Again, not true. You'll have seen from those apprenticeships that there are different entry levels and there's something suitable for, for everybody. Low pay as well. Uh, again, not true in construction. There are great earning potentials within the industry. Um, I've mentioned it being dangerous. Uh, our, the, the health and safety and well-being of our people are, are is our highest priority. Um, we have, you know, many policies in place. We have health and safety managers on each site. We really look after our people. Um, working outdoors or poor working conditions. Again, yes, some roles are working outdoors if that's what you want to do. But many are office based or working in the site cabins as well. So it isn't always a cold and dirty environment you'd be working in. You can find a lot more information on early careers at SES on our website. We've got a page dedicated to early careers 
where you can hear some videos from our current apprentices, read some um, documents that tell you a bit more about what to expect from our apprenticeships as well. Uh, I think there's a video there as well with me explaining a bit about how apprentices work at SES. So yeah, I think that is now it from me and be good to take any questions. Amazing, Sam. Thanks ever so much for that. And indeed, thank you to all of you. I think what's been really helpful and interesting there is the kind of the diversity in terms of the organisations and the sectors and professions that you represent. So it's really encouraging and exciting, I think, for that matter, for young people to, to be hearing these messages and have something very, very kind of tangible to be thinking about going forward, whether you're in year 10, whether you're in year 13. Um, there's clearly a plethora of possibilities right on our doorstep in Greater Manchester. So thank you for bringing that to life and, and kind of explaining that for parents and carers on the call. Um, I've only got a couple of questions, which probably isn't the worst thing in the world because I'm just cautious of time here now, but one of the questions that we've had, which I think is quite important, and you sort of all touched on it in a, in a slight way, in one way or the other. If I could trouble whoever wants to come in first, <laughs> it's like it's a game show, um, what, how significant is it from your kind of HR perspective or in terms of your talent acquisition sort of departments around young people having had some work experience or, you know, even if it's not directly what you're actually going to be doing with them in terms of the apprenticeship they do, do you think that is significant and important for all young people to try and do, especially if they're looking at something that's work based? I'll stick my hand up. Um, Thanks, Darren. Um, I think it's a good idea um, to run that. So what we generally do at Jackson's is that if someone expresses interest in an apprenticeship, because we don't run a, um, a routine intake, we just take um, applications and then assess them in their, their own right. We would invite that young person, whoever they are, to come and spend a week at one of our sites um, or multiple sites just to get a good idea um, of what we do just before they they take the plunge into that sector because I think a lot mine and a lot of the other sectors that we've seen here today you just might not necessarily know what the inner workings of those businesses are and until you get a glimpse in you don't really know if that's for you yeah okay yeah that's interesting fantastic a question um, that actually I've been asked in the past and somebody's come on and asked it this afternoon, which I think is a pertinent one and, and a good one to use as an example this afternoon, is um, how you, and in terms of your kind of your, your ability to kind of communicate with and make yourselves known to young people, because it can be a little bit challenging, a little bit difficult for young people to navigate in some cases where the best places are to go and search for apprenticeship opportunities. And I don't know whether you'd agree with that. So obviously we've got the .gov um, kind of light link, which, you know, lots and lots of apprenticeship vacancies go through that. If you're an organisation that doesn't advertise your, your vacancies in that way, what ways do you use to make yourselves known to young people in terms of kind of marketing and make increasing awareness about your you're being there basically and having a work based opportunity for young people. Anybody want to answer that? Um, I just like to say that we we do use the Gov website, but we okay. also do a lot of promoting on social media as well. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, our wider group business has an Instagram page as well. So, yeah, social media is uh, a huge platform for advertising the apprenticeships. OK, fantastic. Just on that, just for the, the, the kind of the information purposes of anybody that's on the call for any parents or carers that are thinking, oh, I'd really like to explore this. Having had a bit of information this afternoon, it might make you think, oh, I could do with going and finding out more. So I would reiterate what I said earlier on about having a chat with your son or daughter about kind of what careers related learn they've been doing, but specifically so really um, making the best of the GMAX website, which we referenced earlier on in the call, because that will allow you and your child together to um, browse and navigate um, not only information, but real and genuine tangible opportunities that they can apply for. So, for example, if you're in year 11 now, um, David mentioned earlier on to me that some of those vacancies and some of those opportunities that he referenced 
although they're being advertised now, they're actually for young people to start later on in the year. So obviously year 11 students aren't in a position to be not going to school and starting a job. They can't by law, apart from anything else, start to do that until well into the summer, probably June or July time. Um, so yeah, I think it's important just to, to get a feel really of what's out there to kind of gauge what the opportunities are, what the employers are looking for. And as I say, GMAX is, is one way that you can do that because as, as an organisation, we like to make sure that anything that is within GM is, is there and available for you to search for. So just a reminder on, on using GMAX to the best of your ability. Um, I think that's it. Do you, does any of the speakers want to add anything before? Sorry, Michaela. Claire, there's a couple of questions that have come. Oh, um, some, some more questions. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yep. that's fine. So, that's my mistake. Um, no, that's absolutely fine. I've just spotted them now. So one's coming for specifically for Brentwood, if you're able to help Jade, um, just to ask about where the specific information is on your website, because they were only able to um, find the graduate information. I was just trying to unmute myself there, it took a moment. Um, so it's on our that graduate page, it's got all the apprenticeships on there and it's got a couple of our placement opportunities as well. Um, but I'm happy to send a link um, that you can share to any of the attendees today um, as well. And like Sam, we're really big on using social media. So we advertise a lot of our vacancies um, and opportunities on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, things like that as well. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jade. Uh, yes, so there is another question here. Somebody's saying, should young people not bother about going to university anymore, or universities anymore? Um, I have a, I have something that I want to say on that, but I'd quite like to open it out to our guest speakers if you'd like to say something on that with regard to your particular offer, if that's OK. Well, I could have a go at answering that. I mean, it depends on the individual and what they want out of that university course. To be honest, a university is actually is a great experience. I mean, look, if I went to university and a thoroughly enjoyable time and learned a lot and enjoyed the experience, but did it enable me to get a job in my industry? No. So it, it depends on what you want out of the experience. You know, for now, if I was at that kind of kind of year thirteen stage, looking to what's next, I'd be looking at university courses and say degree apprenticeships and seeing and comparing what was, what was available. Uh, and trying to be honest, if you're going to university, to get as vocational a course as possible, especially a course with good industry links, if that makes sense. But university, whether you go or not, is down to the individual person making that choice because it is still a fabulous experience where you learn an awful lot and you get a great qualification out of it. But it's not for everyone. So, it, but it's very much it's making sure you're aware of all the options. I think not thinking is I have to go to university or I have to get a job. Yeah. You can do a degree apprenticeship as well. And looking across all of it, and does it is it right for you as an individual? Yeah. And it also very much depends on what the job is, what kind of like the end desire is. So, for example, there is certain professions um, medical and scientific professions in particular. There isn't any kind of element of choice. So, for example, there's no such thing as a degree apprenticeship to be a doctor. Um, there's no such thing as a degree apprenticeship to be a vet um, and various other kind of scientific lab roles. So in some cases, there isn't that element of choice. We could go, well, shall I do the apprenticeship route or shall I do the graduate route? But um, also worth mentioning is the fact, and I know again it's been referenced by our, our speakers this afternoon, is the fact that you can bring those two worlds together and study on a degree apprenticeship. So you're getting the best of both worlds there. Um, and as I say, further information definitely available through GMAX and definitely available um, through your, your son or daughter's school in terms of getting more information or being signposted to the right places for information that you can share with each other. OK, right, fantastic. Four minutes to go. We're doing well. OK, so once again, thanks very much um, to our speakers and obviously for your amazing individual presentations and answering the questions, of course. Um, for the people that have tuned into the call, for parents, carers, students, teachers, careers leaders, anybody else who's been on the call today, I really hope that it's been a helpful and insightful session for you. And I really hope that it's generated a great sense of positivity and possibility about the wonderful and varied opportunities available to young people right on our doorsteps across Greater Manchester. 
Um, very finally, um, I'm going to ask Michaela to put um, the link in the, um, the Q&A there for you to take notice. Please could I politely ask you to complete some electronic feedback about the session that you've been on today. We as a team are always keen to ever improve and develop the quality of the activities and the events that we put on for you and you providing your thoughts and views is a great way for us to do that. And very finally, thank you so, so much again to all the speakers. Thanks to you, Michaela, for your very capable assistance with the slip tech and for everyone who's taken the time to join and participate with the call today. Have a pleasant evening and take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.